hi. <laughs> I just left, but you guys will see this the next day. And this has nothing to do with Lego. So if you're not interested, that's nothing to do with Lego. Absolutely nothing. I'm sure Lego might be mentioned <laughs> because it's talking to me, me talking. <clears throat> so one of my earliest memories, and this is going way back to being three or four or five. And it was, you know, it, it, people used to read. <laughs> Let's just start that way. People used to read books uh, because there was no internet. There was no internet back then. I mean, you could listen to your radio. You could listen to your phonograph. You could listen to your A-track, your cassette tape, which was catching on at the time. Uh, no DVDs, no CDs, no e-readers, nothing. This is... This is, computers were not in people's houses yet, by the way. <laughs> this is, hey, you kids, get off my grass. There was no computers except the big mainframes in the big industries back in the day. This is the early 70s. Bruce Gates, Bruce Gates, Bill Gates wasn't doing anything. Steve Jobs wasn't doing anything. It's 1971, 1972. The, the Commodores weren't around. The pets, the IBMs. There was IBM company, because if you watch... You know, uh, Hidden Figures, you know, IBM was around, but they're just pulling up in the late 60s. But anyway, there used to be uh, an author, a journalist. Uh, this journalist was a major in World War One. That's how old he is. And he was a, uh, a reporter in World War Two, and reported for, I believe, the Toronto Telegraph, which became the Toronto Telegraph sun or the star i can't remember the telegraph at the time anyway he used to write for when i when i was a kid he used to write for a magazine called uh weekend weekend magazine i think it was called it's in one of these little biographies that he used to work for and he used to publish this cute these cute little stories uh and uh, my dad read them <laughs> and he read them to us <laughs> and then we got the anthologies. An anthology is a com uh, it's a compilation of his stories in books. And so you could buy the books afterwards. And I think he died in 1978. His name was Gregory Clark. Greg Clark. Gregory Clark. And he was born pre, obviously, World War One because he was a major in World War I. Uh, and then, as I say, he was a uh, reporter, went overseas in World War II to report the war. And uh, but he also had these wonderful little stories. And so when I grew up and and on our little library at our house were these four books. And this one's Fishing with Gregory Clark. Not necessarily my favorite because I hate fishing, but the stories in here are awesome. Uh, May Your First Love Be Your Last, which is my favorite book. Some beautiful stories in here. Uh, this one's called Outdoors with Gregory Clark. And I did find the first edition of this book. <laughs> <laughs> the Value Village a couple of months back, and I have that upstairs. But and then, and then Grandma preferred steak, and so this is what these are the books I grew up with, and I would just grab one sporadically because they're all like one or two page stories, um, and so this is, uh, this, so there's a little story that goes to here, and another story that starts on, uh, and so most of these stories don't go past a page or two. And they're nice little cute stories. And a lot of people back then, if you never heard of this guy, it's perfectly understandable because he's been dead for 40 years. Um, many people at the time, because he, he kept on publishing these stories over and over and over again, different stories that happened to him. And they're all interesting stories, I think. And, uh, and people said, how can this, all these stories happen to one person? This has got to be, this guy's making it up or it's a compilation of everybody else's into one person. Uh, so this, this, the, the stuff happened across five or six or 10 people. And the guy is just writing him down and as he's the star of the story. And he said, no, <laughs> all this stuff happened to me. Now, that said, he also uh, readily admitted that he does embellish some of the stories. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> no, there's no embellishing here. <laughs> I'm going to say this guy was a role model <laughs> for, for my tangents uh, because he does go off on them. Uh, not necessarily as inept as me because his tangents actually pertain to the initial story and factor right into it. And it's, it's, there's usually a cute little punchline or a little whatever at the end. Um, but we also got this one, War Stories with Gregory Clark. Um, and, 
this is a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic read. Now, this is not Saving Private Ryan. These are, again, nice stories, poignant stories sometimes, uh, lighthearted stories sometimes, but it's about the war, both wars that he was in. And, and, and what happened after uh, some time goes by, and it was, again, this is where the internet does show up, uh, a few years back, I was wondering, and I can't remember if I was talking to somebody about it, but I was wondering, aren't there other stories? Because I think in the front of this, it tells you that there are other stories. Other, uh, the Birds of Promise and Outdoors with Gregory Clark, which I have. So, um, let's see what's, uh, other stories written by Greg Clark. I should have looked at this before. Birds of Promise, which I will look for in used bookstores all the time. Oh, look, my name. But that's not my writing. That's my dad's writing. <laughs> my dad gave me this book. <laughs> so, um, uh, does it say in here, 1969. So these, most of these books were published pre-1970. Um, and um, I, I love this, the May Your First Love Be Your Last. It's a really nice poignant story. And it's really, I, I love it. And then um, uh, this edition, 1978. Uh, but it was published before then. Um, he knew Hemingway. <laughs> so, he knew a lot of people. Um, so I don't know. If there, so anyway, I, I wanted to figure out if there was other books, because I've read these books repeatedly a lot. I won't say I read these books nearly as much as the Foundation Trilogy, because I read the Foundation Trilogy quite a bit many times, or as many as times as the Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I probably... Out of all the books I've ever read, I read those the most times because you can just pick them up at any point and read. Um, and book 52 of the Hardy Boys. <laughs> I don't know why book 52 loved, I loved it so much. I've read that thing at least six or seven times. Um, but I have read these. And again, I don't usually read the whole thing. I read a couple stories and, oh, that's great. And then I go on and do something else. And I come back and grab another one and read a couple stories. But I was wondering if there was other books, like The Birds of Promise, which you see in this book that says, hey, he also wrote, also wrote The Birds of Promise. I, it takes a long time for me to understand how the internet works. And I just went on Amazon. <laughs> and I typed in Gregory Clark <laughs> the other day. Actually, it was about a couple of years back when I first did that. And I said, oh, there's a lot of books out there that we do not have from Gregory Clark. Now, there's lots of Gregory Clarks in the history of the world, by the way, who wrote books. So you have to find this guy. <laughs> so he's, he's not some sort of uh, triple PhD guy talking about whatever nuclear physics, because there's some books out there about that, or some lawyerly guy who's talking about lawyer stuff. But you'll you, there's a definitive difference between you know, may your first love be your last and fishing with Gregory Clark and the nuances of the Higgs bosons, whatever. So you'll be able to find his books pretty easy on Amazon. And so I did. And lo and behold, look what came in the mail yesterday. Yay! Now, I found four or five books that we did not have from this guy. And my issue was, is that when I put him in my basket I don't know, for checkout and I looked at the total, it was $118. Going $118. No, 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 no. I'm not paying $118. Uh, but what I did do, and this is before shipping, what I did do is I found two, I think I ordered two, two books that were under like $15 each. Uh, I can't remember the price of this one. Uh, and I've already, I, on page, I was just reading it today, page 55. And the, the stories are different than any of these stories. Like each one of these books seems to have different stories in it. Now, the war stories with Gregory Clark, some of those stories were in the other books. Some of them. Very, very few. But war stories seems to be a compilation of just all his war stories. And it wasn't uh, these groups and those groups and those groups put in the books. So war stories kind of covered the entire time. Because he wrote some of the war stories long after the war, looking back at the war. So, uh, and some of those war stories, he was writing from the trenches. So, you know, take it, take with it as you will. Uh, the Birds of Promise, the stories are a little longer than these ones, which I like because it's three or four pages each and you get right into it and there's a bit, it's a nice short story. And again, they, he does go off in some tangents, <laughs> but it's, it's usually, there's some poignancy and it has a, it has a nice outlook on life, the world. He lived in Toronto, uh, most of his life. 
and um, he lost his wife years before he passed away. I think, as I said, 1978, he passed away. Could have been later. Um, so he lived on his own in Toronto and watched he, many, many stories about how the city had changed over his lifetime. Um, the one thing I really loved about this one, uh, I just was reading this one story, and the story is called The Age of Techno Lunacy is Upon Us. And he wrote it in 1969, 1970. <laughs> the age of techno lunacy and i think that is a completely apt name for what we are dealing with uh i just finished watch again tangent i just finished watching the news and um i'm not a swifty i am definitely not a swifty but i do feel bad for taylor swift today uh out of all days like honest to goodness I, uh, it's just it's just disheartening and and there's there's no there's going to be no recourse. There's going to be no, there's going to be no comeuppance. There's going to be, no, there's going to be nothing of the sort. Like the, the, the internet back in the late nineties and early two thousands was such a vision of hope for getting together and like-minded people to build things like Lugnet. Um, and again, I keep on saying to this day, the worldwide Lego phenomenon would not have happened were it not for Lugnet. It wouldn't have because we, the Lugnet itself, brought so many groups together quick and we built a huge layout a uh, huge layout a huge huge uh group uh web of fan groups around the world that started with lugnet no lugnet's nothing to do with it now straight up but if if there's any history about the worldwide phenomena a lego lugnet has to be mentioned <laughs> But anyway, that's a tangent. Um, but what 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 uh, Taylor's putting up with today is techno lunacy. It really is. There's no there's no other way of looking at it, and there's no way of fixing it, because you you can't lock down the internet. But anyway, that's I'm not going to go off on that tangent. That just, just hit my head now because I'm putting techno lunacy. Um, I'm going to finish that story. But what I really wanted, uh, because I got that book, The Birds of Promise, and I'm loving it. It's absolutely wonderful. But I think my favorite, favorite story of all time, and I would, I would, I'm not going to read it to you. Because this is not, you know, hey, gather on the fire, kids. This is the fire, fire, fireplace chat that, you know, Roosevelt used to do. I think it was Roosevelt. Roosevelt used to do. <laughs> gather on the fire. Gather on the radio, kids. The, 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 knob and tube radio <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to go off on that tangent, um, but it's called La Mer, and it is one of my favorite stories. And I, I think should some script writer for a movie industry stumble across this book, War Stories, and read La Mer, M-E-R, they would say this is a good movie. Not like Fury, which was a great movie, but harsh to watch, or, you know, the... Uh, Saving Private Ryan, which was a great movie, but harsh to watch. Or those other movies that are really great, but harsh to watch. <laughs> um, I'll give you the synopsis. that I haven't even read it the past two decades, but I, I remember because I was going to talk about this guy. when I. So Lemaire, basically, he is now in World War II. So he's a reporter. And he's elderly because he wasn't young enough to be in the war because he was in World War One as a major. So uh, he went back for this newspaper to report in World War Two, and he'd be hanging on the barracks. But of course, he was in World War One, so he understands how things work and blah blah. And people accepted him on the barracks and on the on the property, uh, on and inside the um, well, inside the barracks. <laughs> the words are escaping me. Um, and so. It's the basically the story goes along like this. There's these kids in the armed forces and they want to go take a trip. They want to go off base for a little bit. And they say to the elderly looking gentleman that could pass as a padre, they say, hey, Greg, come on with us because then we can get past the guards easier. <laughs> and he says, sure. And they're in, I think it's in Italy. I think they're in Italy. Uh, and, uh, you know, Italy, I think it's Italy. La Mer. No, maybe it's France. Sorry, France, Italy. I'm, I'm mixing that story up with BC. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> uh, BC, BC. Um, so he, he goes, um, yeah, so here it goes. Uh, so he's in, with, he's in the Jeep with these kids now. Uh, the kids in, you know, little, you know, PR, privates and stuff. We parked our Jeep in the square. Puzzled American military police smiled at, 
smiled us, welcomed, and waved us on the town because this old guy's with him. It must be, must be important. <laughs> the square of the streets were deserted from windows. Eager, cautious faces peered out at us. My young comrades, lobsters of mine, figured that a tavern would be the likeliest place to find out about lobsters. So anyway, so they're looking for food on the town. Uh, blah, blah, blah. They go up the streets, blah, blah, blah. And from the radio, turn on full blast from a broadcasting station belonging somewhere to the free French underground, Charles Trenet, the famous French singer, was singing La Mer, which is why the story is called La Mer. A song he himself had composed, The Sea. And with them, tears pouring down their faces, their arms around one another, shoulders embracing, sobbing, the whole quivering of assemblage. Because so there's a group of people on the street in this little town gathered around this window. And these four guys and Greg Clark come up to it. And what's going on here? And they're listening to La Mer and the music. And so, and these people are crying and holding each other. Taverns, of course, were out of bounds to the Americans. But when I explained to the protester in the din that we are Canadians, we are uproariously welcomed <laughs> because people love Canadians. Blah, blah. So, um, so in once, oh, sorry, that they, they, they weren't gathered around the window yet. So I don't want to get too confusing. So they were at the tavern as Canadians. And then they went out for a walk afterwards. Uh, and this, uh, it took possession after an, about an hour when my comrades went in quest of lobsters with a dozen young sailors and escort. He took me to see the town. So now Greg's with somebody from the tavern and they're going to go look at the town while the kids go off and find lobsters. We visited the docks, quays, crushed port facilities. We called at several houses so that I might be introduced to friends of his. So he's just taking around town. In one small street, a knot of people was gathered. See, that's what I thought about the knot of people. One, a snot of people were gathered outside a cottage, idly waiting at closed doors and apparently trying to see in the windows. You know, life goes on. My old sailor explained quietly as we passed that a girl who lived there in the cottage had been a sweetheart of a German soldier of the recent garrison and that day of liberation, a posse of cherbougers, <laughs> burgies, <laughs> And there were some of these words I don't know. <laughs> and I'm an English major. Uh, Cher Bougers had cut off her hair because that's what you did with people who, you know, gave gave comfort to the enemy. Uh, she was inside with her parents. Of course, as a war, a war correspondent, because that's what Greg Clark is, I had already heard of several instances of this mob action against those who were called collaborators. To this day, I have never been able to figure out whether it was sheer curiosity, because he's writing this decades later. Just so you know. So he's writing about his memories of going to France. Uh, to this day, I have never been able to figure out whether it was sheer curiosity on my part or perhaps journalistic in inquiry or perhaps, above all, Trenant's La Mer singing, ringing in my ears. For it is still my favorite of all small songs. But I turned to my old sailor and said, Do you think I could see her? We went into a neighboring house. The woman of that house went around the back of the houses by the walls. And in a few minutes, I was ushered secretly by way of the back door to the besieged cottage. A pallid gray man, moving slowly as if in deep shock, took my hand when the sailor introduced me. He listened as my old sailor explained that I was a chaplain, <laughs> which I think is great. You see, my appearance suggested this even to my tavern acquaintances. <laughs> so he, this, this is the tangent that actually work in the story. Uh, the man still holding my hand led me along the small dark hall with its florid purple wallpaper. Like, the details. This is decades after the fact that he remembers walking down his hallway. Softly, he opened the door and nodded me into the little darkened room. On the bed lay what I thought at first was a child. The blankets pulled up to her chin. Her head was small, round, white, like the head of a china doll that had lost its wig. Her eyes were closed. Of all the things I had seen in my life, and this is a guy who fought in World War I, by the way. Of all the things I had seen, and there's some really good stories about World War I and his other one. And anyway, of all the things I had seen in my life, this is the one I am sorriest I saw. The round, small, naked head, the ears so gross, grotesquely bared, bared the large shadowed eye sockets, the mouth composed in a tiny figurine of utter despair. My sailor in the hall coughed briefly. The girl opened her eyes. She stared blankly at me. Then slowly, like a curtain falling at the end of a tragic play, her eyes closed. We backed out. I hurried to rejoin my young comrades at the jeep in the square. They had lobsters. I hummed Le Maire all the way home to get to the Canadian front so as to remember it, never to forget it. 
Man, that was 14 years ago. Okay, so not dozens, but 14 years ago. So he wrote this. This has been 1945, 1950, 1959, he wrote this. <laughs> Man, that was 14 years ago. Last week, A.G. Green, he knew a lot of people, by the way. <laughs> Last week, A.G. Green came home from a holiday in England. He came back on a French boat. Hey, he said to me on the phone, I met a friend of yours on the boat. So this is 14 years after the war. I met a friend of yours on the boat. Oh, I said. My cabin steward, he said, a little chunky old guy who had been a sailor, he told me how he had met a middle-aged Canadian war correspondent right after Cherboro was liberated. Oh, no, I cried. He told me about taking you around to town. About the little girl. So I've started to get misty. This is why I think it makes a good movie. About the girl? Yes. When he described you, I said, I knew you. He asked me to be sure and tell you what had happened to the girl. Go ahead, go ahead, I say. I could hear Le Maire starting up to orchestrate in my head. The German boy came back and married her. They went away. Her hair had all grown back in beautiful. Do you know what I said? God, I thank you. That is what I said. War is so small, so sad, so inexcusable. It's a beautiful story. It is beautiful. The, the, the kid came back, married her, and they lived happily ever after. Uh, that story sticks with me. Uh, most a lot of these stories stick with me, but that one that one got me. Uh, that one out of all the stories, I mean, there's some really really good stories in here, because uh, there is a highway, there's a road in Toronto. I don't know if it's this last story. I don't think it was this last story. I don't think it's in this one, but he talks about it's in one of these ones. I'm gonna have to find it really really quick. Maybe it's this one. Um. They might be looking out their windows, which is a really tough one. So he talks about him coming back from World War One, and his his brother uh, coming back from World War One, uh, and his dad. Thankful to God that the, his two kids came back from World War One, but everybody else in the street had lost their sons in World War One. So he says, so his two boys when they're walking home, walk quietly when you come back because everybody's looking out their windows. And they didn't have their boys come home. So it was very, very tough. It was very, very tough. Uh, boys, he said, I have a favor. So this is his dad talking to him and his brother. Boys, he said, I have a favor to ask you. Yes, sir. I ask you, he said in his face tense, not to walk up or down Howland Avenue in Toronto. I want you to come to our house from now on by coming up either Albany or Brunswick to Barton, then along Barton here and down to the house. Our house was seven doors below Barton. We stared at our dad. He went over and kicked the candle coal flickering in the fireplace because this is 1940 <laughs> or 1930-something. Um, starting at the bottom of Blurry, he said, Billy Hall Air Force killed in action. We didn't know. Then, our dad said, up the street, a few doors this side, Captain Cecil Perry, artillery, killed in action. Oh, no, I muttered. Across the street from the Perrys, continued our father, Captain Bill and Lieutenant Jake McLaren and infantry, both killed in action. He was naming all our boyhood playmates, our high school chums, the comrades of our own manhood, our own young manhood. Joe, my brother, and sat down in the Morris chair and covered his eyes. Up the street here across the road went on Dad. This young fellow whose name I don't know, who boarded at 79, a student of engineering at the School of Science, engineers, killed in action. My father went out the window and without parting the curtains, stared out at Holland Avenue. From downstairs came the tumult of our party of welcome home. All the young men of the one block of Holland Avenue were gone, except us. Fantastic. No, normally, <clears throat> here's me getting misty. Those are the saddest, darkest ones. This is usually pretty light, very, very light, but he does have poignancy to some of his stories. And that's possibly why there's a wide gambit of stories from the, the frivolous. Uh, he talks about his kindergarten teacher <laughs> when he's like 50, 60 years old. Uh, I love that one. It's a really good story. He talks about fishing, and it's the only time I actually like fishing is reading his fishing stories. <laughs> so, uh, and he talks about birds a lot. He's a he was an avid bird watcher, and he talks about all the birds that he got to see in his entire lifetime. So there, it goes from the frivolous to the mundane to the crazy, the outright lunacy uh, to the the farcical. There are some stories that are just farce of a, a cute little half hour sitcom. Uh, but he also gets serious every once in a while, and and I love him for it. And um, he, he passed away when I was 11, and yet I, here I am at 50, whatever, uh, reading his stories and just excited, just beyond excited to get another book of his. And I will be looking for the other ones 
as long as they're cheaper. <laughs> and, um, and and I always keep it out. Every time we pass a used bookstore, you know, I, I go look. Um, but I wanted to talk about that because this, this to me, this is important. To, to me, this is history that it's not world shattering history. It's not like politicians and pontificators and huge statesmen and massively like you know einstein educated people that changed the world for generations this is a, a very small man according to his own say his stature was very short uh who was a major in world war one and a reporter in world war two and he, he had all these cute little stories and and he does say they all happened to him again with some embellishment they all happened to him and he loved writing them down i used to write a lot I used to write my own little newspaper <laughs> back in the day called the Went Under Press, uh, and and I used to have a blog way back in the day because I used to like writing. Uh, I wrote a book that had nothing to do with my love of writing, but I had to use my love of writing to write a book. Uh, I love writing. I used to love writing. I just don't have the time or the energy anymore, and my elocution and my word choice has drastically gone down abysmally because I don't read anymore hardly. But I am reading this one. And I'm happy I'm reading this one. I'm happy I got this one. Um, but that's it. That's uh, that's all she wrote today. That's what I wanted to talk about. Nothing to do with Lego. Sorry. <laughs> but it is it is it is nice to have. The older I get, the more the more I'm appreciating these stories. Because when I was a kid, they were just cute little stories. But the older I get, I see how he had an outlook of him getting older. And he talks about it a lot. And I didn't notice it when I was a kid. But he talks about how he's getting older in his 60s and 70s. And trying to get around town and trying to do this. And he's remembering stuff from way back then. Um, and so it is very interesting. And it's also interesting that this is, I think, the one of the latest stories is like in the mid-70s. How much life has changed and yet hasn't changed at all. Because <laughs> some of the stories are about that, living in the 60s and 70s and the speeding cars and the big freeways and blah, 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 and, and the traffic and blah, blah, blah. And people have been complaining about this. And it's just like I talked about, this is, I guess, a tangent to bring in the Lego story I talked about with the, you know, you have to call it Lego bricks when you're talking. Uh, and I said, that's, a, that's like a zombie um, uh, topic of conversation because it, it, it continuously dwindles down to like murmur and you don't hear about it and then once every five or six years and boom it's like front page news of every like single lego oh we must call it lego bricks no we don't have to call it lego bricks oh we should call it lego bricks because what the lego company wants and blah blah it, it shows it rears its ugly head almost every half decade <laughs> it really does and then you get the people in the two camps it's amazing reading these stories that are from the 60s and the 70s and 50s that they had exactly the same and he made fun of it. <laughs> so it's, and he had uh, keen observations of humanity. Let's, let's call it that. I, I think that's a good way of putting it. He had keen observations of humanity and uh, and he, he was never, never uh, scared to, to self de to, deprecate he, he was he's the, he's the king of self-deprecation <laughs> and i'm pretty good at it myself <laughs> so i uh i i think highly of me but i don't think highly of me that my ego gets in the way of doing other things i i will put myself down <laughs> all the time it doesn't mean i love myself any less it's just that i have a keen sense of humor that uh self-deprecating is part of my sense of humor and it's definitely part of his sense of humor he knows how small stature he is and he knows his place in the world and uh he has no problem making fun of it and i have no problem making fun of me uh so that's it that's almost 30 minutes of talking about one of my favorite authors of all time and i was very excited to get a book when i get book number two i probably not gonna make a video about it but i um i'm looking forward to getting it i'm gonna have this one done by then and I'm going to pass it on to some of my other relatives who also, again, my dad, uh, love this guy uh, and uh, was asking me about it. So that's why I have the book. <laughs> so uh, that's it. That's all. I'm going to stop being a little misty about this. Um, there you go. I will talk to you guys soon. I hope everybody out there is doing well and uh, stay safe. And I'll talk to you.